Good morning. Ahla wa sahla. Welcome. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to welcome you all today, those of you who are with us and those of you who are watching us via our web stream, to the 2014 Euro Arab Dialogue Forum of the Lutfiya Rabbani Foundation. For those who don't know me, my name is Jumana Al Zain Khouri, and I'm the director of the foundation. Our founder, Mahmoud Rabbani's lifetime commitment was focused on developing a mutual and equal relationship between the Arab world and Europe. Today, Mahmoud Rabbani's legacy continues through the various activities of the foundation, which all focus on our one core value, supporting and promoting a constructive Euro-Arab dialogue and understanding. And this is specifically what we hope to achieve today. In a time filled with so many misconceptions, our aim is to shed the light on what is specifically happening in the Arab world and Europe and foster a dialogue that we hope will create a more tolerant and understanding relationship for the future. As a foundation that has its roots in both parts of the world, we think that tolerance and collaboration be between both Europe and the Arab world are key factors to a better future. And we felt that organizing this conference today was not only topical, but essential. Essential in the need of decision makers from Europe and the Arab world to discuss their common future, as well as in the demand from the general public to understand the context in order to forge a future. And this feeling became an evidence when the speakers, the sponsors, the partners, and the public present today decided to follow us in this endeavor. And for this, we are really and sincerely grateful. Throughout the day, you will be able to listen, comment, and question different points of views from speakers coming from political, economic, social, cultural, and civil society backgrounds. Our hope is that by the end of the day, our understanding of the Arab world would have broadened and that the belief in the importance and essentiality of an open relationship between both regions of the world would have become an evidence. Let me end by addressing a few uh, practical issues. We have really, really tried to make this conference as interactive as possible by having it web streamed and offering the possibility for people physically present here but also watching us over the net to comment and ask questions to our speakers via Twitter. So please make sure that your phones are switched on, but on silent mode. And your comments and questions can be sent to hashtag 2014EUArab. Hashtag 2014EUArab. One last point. As a dialogue forum, we offer an open and free platform for people to speak and exchange ideas. These ideas, however, may or may not reflect our own beliefs as a foundation. I'm truly, truly grateful that BBC's chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, is here with us to act as our master of ceremony. Her extensive knowledge, experience, and understanding of the Arab world and its people make her the perfect person to guide us throughout the day. We could not have hoped to be in better hands. So without further ado, please welcome Ms. Lise Doucette. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Sabal khair. Ladies and gentlemen, this is no way to begin a conversation. Sabal khair. Welcome to this wonderful forum in such a wonderful setting. You couldn't have chosen it better. Next to the Peace Palace, in the Hague Academy of International Law, trees outside, and all of you here with us. I'm a journalist, so I will begin with a story. Once upon a time, not so long ago, in fact, quite a long time ago, in 1934, Mahmoud Salim Rabani was born in Haifa, in Palestine. At a very young age, he lost his father. 
at a very young age, he lost his land. But a life of nearly 70 years was a journey of the kind that brings all of us here today. Studies in Syria, in Lebanon, commerce and studies here in The Hague, and a life which brought him friends and places, Algeria, Jordan, Kuwait, Tunisia, and all of those people from all of those places are with us here today. And with Mahmoud's wife, Anissa, son Salim, Moin, Moin, <laughs> Khalid is on his way, Nihal is coming tonight, and Karim Rabani is on the Twitter account. They called Mahmoud a bridge builder. And here today in his beloved second city, we join together from Europe, from the Arab world and beyond to build bridges again. At a time when we can no longer say that Europe is in the Middle East, because now the Middle East is in Europe. And perhaps ironically, or perhaps tragically, at a time when we have never been more connected, at moments, we seem that we've never been further apart. And that is why we gather today for dialogue, for understanding. But this is not a day just of talking. Today we'll have cartoons, we'll have music, we'll have movies, we'll have lunch, and of course, we'll have some laughs. And we begin our conversation with a man who just happens to be the foreign minister of the Netherlands. But even if he wasn't the foreign minister of the Netherlands, Mahmoud Rabani would want Bert Kunders to be with us here today. And why? Because he has spent a quarter of a century working in national, regional, and international work. A man who was the UN representative in Mali, the special representative in Côte d'Ivoire, who spent several years as Netherlands Minister of Development Cooperation. He's just recently taken on this task of being the Foreign Minister. So today he joins us to talk not about his old job, cooperation, but his new job, cooperation. Please join me in welcoming the Foreign Minister of the Netherlands. Thank you very much for this uh, kind uh, introduction uh, this morning and thank you for being all here today in, uh, in the Netherlands on this very important event, talking about the Arab future and the role of Europe. Uh, and thank you for joining us for an enormous important topic, Europe-Arab dialogue. It's something that is very close to my heart. I was actually asked this morning to introduce uh, Lakhdar Brahimi and I'm very glad to do so. I'm actually glad I can say a few things more, but my, my sense was actually to introduce this morning His Excellency Lakhdar Brahimi. Uh, your work as a, as a diplomat, as a mediator, has always been a source of inspiration to me. We had, and I had the honor uh, to meet with Lakhdar Brahimi recently as, uh, in the meetings of special representatives of the Secretary General. And you were the parameter, I would say, as a peacemaker, as a diplomat, uh, as an inter intellectual, but also, I would say, as a man uh, who represents the craftsmanship of the great um, tradition of uh, Algerian diplomacy. And that is a big tradition. Uh, and I wouldn't talk about my last job, although it's difficult. If you just come four weeks ago from uh, the desert of Mali trying to make peace uh, and coming back in the ministry here, but you see how many similarities there are, not so much in temperature, but in the type of work you have to do. And in Algeria, actually, as we speak today, uh, the different groups in Mali are trying to find peace under the leadership under the, of the Algerian uh, foreign minister. So I'm very, uh, very, very happy that you are here. Uh, and it is clear to me that that represents something that is so urgent 
when we talk about Euro-Arab dialogue, that is, how can we find peaceful ways, diplomatic ways, communication between us in a time of devastation, of killing? Uh, and how can we really think about what a political solution is uh, to the situation, for instance, in Syria, probably something that is all close to our hearts and minds today? I think, first of all, we should say that diplomacy can, no, should make a difference in the lives of our people. It should be an active diplomacy based on a real dialogue, which you are starting and continuing here today. And it is up to us, if you wish, the international community, if that word still exists, as well as partners in the region to make it happen. Your presence and your advice here today should inspire us all and give us input for the necessary next steps. Expanding the Euro-Arab dialogue, that is the main mission of the Luftia Rabani Foundation, the foundation created by her son, Mahmoud Rabani. Mahmoud Rabani was a remarkable man, an epitome of the Dutch-Arab dialogue. And for many of my generation, he was the embodiment of the meeting of two worlds, the Arab and the Dutch, in a time where few of my compatriots rarely, if at all, gave any thought about the Arab world. He died before his time, in 2002, at the age of 68, and his spirit lives on in the foundation he created. I'd like to use this opportunity, as it is an introduction to the main speaker, just to share with you some very few ideas about present developments and future possibilities, roles and responsibilities, focusing specifically on the current situation in Libya and Iraq, Syria. And ultimately, much of what we want to bring about it turns around behavior and attitudes, and therefore politics and diplomacy. And that will be maybe a few of my, my final remarks. With everything happening in the Arab world today, the topic chosen for this forum, in that sense, could not be more pertinent. And the future is now. Uh, it's made by us in the present. And there are huge challenges. Let me refer to start with the developments in Libya, where there is a power vacuum and where public authority is only limited to a small spread stretch of the country. Is there a lot of interest in Europe on Libya? And the answer is no. I went to my first uh, meeting of European uh, foreign ministers, and I was happy that the new high representative is, is putting that on the agenda. Uh, Libya is a very complicated case. We can't go into the details right now. But I have, if you wish, uh, looked at the immediate consequences for the problem I was working on in Mali. The unintended consequences of the intervention in Libya have created enormous problems for the whole Sahelo, um, uh, Saharian countries, the belt just under this. We will have to put on the agenda, and we will, we, we will in the next uh, meeting that we have Libya, and trying to find where there are catalyzing forces, also coming from Europe, First of all, in understanding what's happening, and secondly, to see if we can also support a UN special representative who's trying to find a dialogue between the two entities, if you wish, in Libya. And it's, Libya is so complicated because we have the north and the south, and even they are in a very complex way linked. But we have to focus on Libya, not only because of the fate of the Libyan people, but also of the intricacies and the, the, the close relationships with all the politics we're talking about in Europe today. Migration, Lampedusa, the enormous discussions that are actually taking place as we speak today between the foreign ministers and the ministers of interior in Italy to see how we confront the issue of all these people finding a grave in the Mediterranean. Second, allow me to mention Syria. I'll say something about it in the end. Uh, the devastating consequences, and not just for the Syrian people, but also for the wider region, notably Lebanon and, and Jordan. The staggering number of victims, uh, well over 200,000, the vast number of refugees and displaced people, which adds to the global refugee crisis that we are witnessing today. Uh, I will end today my, my speech with, with a poem, uh, maybe out of a certain sense of incapacity of solving this issue from Europe. But let me assure you that, in my view, we know that there is not a military solution to the Syrian problem. Military instruments can play a vital role against dev devastation and killing and in saving people. But I think we all realize that there's only a political solution to the problems in Syria and Iraq. I had the, the pleasure this morning to discuss this also with, with Mr. Brahimi, who has, who has worked on this, who continues to work on this. 
for me there is no taboo on this in the sense that we will have to talk to the countries in the region, all of them. We will have to find in intelligence ways on talking about the support for the Mistura, who is now the UN Special Representative. And we have to support him in finding, in the end, a political solution where all the communities can find a space in the future of their countries. It sounds very easy right now to say this, but sometimes we make it so complex that the passivity on, on, on going on the, on the diplomatic track uh, is, is staggering. And I think when this country, my own country, is involved in this, in Iraq, we have 16s, and I think they are necessary in view of, of, of the violence of ISIS. But we know this has to be part of a political strategy, and that is one of the priorities of, in any case, this new government uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Iraq, but that's not it. If it's inclusive, we have to support it in being inclusive. And for me, it's important to, to underline this, in, this important point. If you talk about dialogue, if you talk about politics, it's not about naivete. It's not excluding a military instrument, but it should be enfolded into a political strategy of really seriously working on peace. And it's a difficult one because the, there are many dilemmas involved every day. And I think it's important to mention it. The third point I would like to highlight related to this is ISIS. I mentioned it. The specter of ISIS poses immediate security threats, not just to the countries where the self-proclaimed caliphate is operating, in Iraq and Syria. Its consequences are felt far and wide. Even in the heart of this very city we're here today, the city of peace, The Hague, where demonstrators have brandished the black flag of ISIS during demonstrations, shouting anti-Semitic slogans. And then, in the discussions, inviting Islamophobic uh, 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 demonstrations uh, in turn, a devastating negative spiral, where we see the close connection between internal and external politics. Yeah, that's a cliche, we say that for 15 years, but now it comes very close. In the face of these realities, a transition is not among the first words that spring to mind. We're witnessing a continuous series of shake-ups, of revolutions and counter-revolutions, of sectorisms, of proxy wars. And if we talk about proxy wars, we have to ensure we talk to all those who are involved in those proxy wars. wars. Um, of, of uh, hybrid wars, and we must realize that, and I'm talking now about the European part of this di dialogue, that we will be touched by these events, that we are uh, touched by these events for many years as well. And let us make no mistakes. I'm the first one to say here that it's not up to the European Union or the Europeans to shape events in Arab countries or to solve their problems. I hope we have learned from this, uh, from the past. But it's the Arab players, movements, where possible civil society that is responsible for shaping their countries. No external pressure or intervention can bring about deep and sustainable change or reform. The call for change needs to come from within the societies. But we have an obligation and a responsibility to catalyze and to support the forces of peace and democracy. In fact, that's exactly what has happened in the Arab world ever since Mohamed Bouzazi, the Tunisian street vendor, now have become so known, when he set himself on fire almost four years ago, on the 17th December of 2010. And in my country you will find streets named after Jan Palach, the Czech student who committed suicide by self-immolation as a political protest against the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Warsaw Pact armies in Rotterdam, in the Alia. And I think it would be a fitting tribute to Mr. Bouazizi if he were honored in the same vein. Because Mr. Bouazizi made clear that people were fed up with ruling elites that made it impossible even for a street vendor to realize his modest dreams. Tragically, his country, Tunisia, is one of the few where structural change seems to have a chance at this stage. In other parts of the Arab world, political willingness to reform proved to be limited for many complex reasons that we can go into right now. But often lip service was paid to the need for transition, economic reform, creation of work, giving a chance to a new generation. And disappointment, if not worse, was quick to set in. And the economic imperatives, the need for stability, local and international power politics, and the heaviness of history took over. The fact that responsibilities rest first and foremost, as it should be always the case, by Arab actors doesn't mean Europe doesn't have a role to play. 
or doesn't have a responsibility in doing no harm and in acting to bring about needed transitions, if you wish. I will use the word. There are two reasons why I think that we should be interested. One major reason rests in factors explained by geographic proximity, by economic interdependencies, by historical ties, by religious sentiments, and by feelings of kinship. We have learned from each other, we've profited from each other, and these and many other factors explain the shared destinies of Europe and the Arab world. And the second reason is that Europe, the European Union, has a clear and obvious interest to see its neighbors, any of our neighbors for that matter, transform into vibrant societies that are more stable, bringing new perspectives to their populations. In sum, helping to catalyze doing no harm improves security on all levels, human, economic, and social. It remains key. Europe may not be able to shape the future, but she can foster and should show more willingness to do so and to support transformation. Reform will be slow and costly and won't necessarily bring political gain in the short run. We can help overcome those obstacles, speeding up a process, creating political space and incentives for reform. And there are many programs that all our societies and governments are doing in practice on this, on women's rights, on human rights, but many others that are directly political. Events in Libya, Syria and Iraq force us to take a closer look at the tenets of European Union support in the recent past. One principle that has been dear to the, us is what they call the incentive-based approach. I'm not so keen on those type of words. Incentive-based approach remembers me of a long time in development and in the World Bank. Well, it's an incentive for whom? It, it's a little bit technocratic language, but it, it, I think it tries to say we should offer more support to countries that reform well, and support should be cut back where reforms are lagging behind. Is that the right approach? It's difficult to say. I don't like the wording of it. I don't think that is part of the language that we need in a Europe-Arab dialogue. The principle of less for less or more for more sounds simple and commonsensical. It should be admitted it can also be too simplistic. Naive in a way. In recent ways we've, been, we've seen how complicated the realities in the Arab world are. It's easy enough to reward countries, also a word that I think we should find a different language for today. Uh, I have the example of Tunisia in mind. Uh, but what to do when talking about transitions no longer makes sense, like in Libya? What to do in places where transition is a process of steps forward and backward at the same time? Egypt is an important strategic partner, and we applaud its engagement to help solve regional problems. But a long-term democratic development also requires human rights and rule of law improvements. And we should continue our dialogue about these issues in a very serious manner. A tailor-made approach should be followed. There is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to southern neighborhood. We are in it for a long haul. Transition doesn't happen overnight, and it will always be a process with ups and downs. A recent advice of the Dutch Advisory Council on International Relations on the future of relations between the Netherlands and the Arab world makes the same argument, and I think they have a valid point. The situation with regard to Iraq, Iraq and Syria, and the rise of ISIS presents us with even more difficult dilemmas. We are confronted with a material threat to regional and international peace and stability. We may be forced to take sides with partners we normally shun. And we are faced with political divisions that make it difficult to come up with an effective solution to the crisis, both globally, within the Security Council, and regionally, epitomized by the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia for regional leadership. And that means we have to talk to them. We have to ensure that they are part of a solution in this horrendous crisis that we see in Syria. This forum is not the appropriate forum for me to take positions on these issues. I just want to underline three notions of a more general nature that all of us need to take to, into account. And then I'll stop because I'm introducing still Lakta Brihimi. It's not my policy speech on the, on the Arab world, but I was so happy to be invited in to do this. One, there is no lasting military solution. I mentioned it already. Only political solutions can show the way forward. For this to become a reality, all players, regional and global, without exception, need to come together. I know it's not easy, but it's not impossible. Taking due consideration of the tremendous suffering of the Syrian and the Iraqi people. The humanitarian cost of these crises is too big for individual countries to continue to let their own interests prevail. Second, if history has proven anything in the Middle East, it's that solutions imposed by outside agencies are bound to fail. The people of Iraq and Syria need to find their own way, supported by unanimous international coalition, which isn't there yet. Both Syria and Iraq are in need of inclusive national governments operating to the benefit of all. 
Sunni and Shias, different groups, different parts of their societies, Alevites and Christian, Kurds and Arabs. And certainly the international community should start, it, should start by the notion, do no harm. Primum non nocere, as the doctor says. If no external pressure and no intervention will bring into being deep and sustainable change or even democracy, what does that mean for the role of the European Union? I believe that the provision of support by the European Union is helpful, yet insufficient in itself. For Europe to really succeed in fostering transition, it's essential that it takes its own behavior and attitudes into account. In the past, we've seen that isolated hard power instruments without political, even cultural strategy, fail spectacularly in bringing about transitions in the Arab world. Success breeds success. If other countries find little to admire in our society, if they feel that following the lead of countries like Russia or China brings greater gains, then we should not be surprised if, if transition fails. I'd like to conclude, and these are not final solutions, as they say, but I, I hope they can assist also in your dialogue. I'd like to conclude by sharing with you a part of a poem by Faraj Bajragdar. It was published in the book Syria Speaks, Art and Culture from the Frontline. A book both shocking and uplifting. Shocking in the way that it shows the appalling consequences of civil war, of war, of devastation. Uplifting in the way it shows that art can be also a healing force. The poem is called Tashrika Prayer for Hams. It describes the kind of city, the, ki the kind of future of the Arab world that the, po the poet is praying for. And I quote, I will go to Homs shortly. I will enter it safely, protected by its people and my face in them. For almost 20 years, only absence, obsession, delusion. For 20 years, abandoned at its crossroads, the guards overwhelmed me with weapons I didn't see, tore at me with weapons I didn't see. But I will come to the city. Any way she accepts me, won't even a few herbs, spices, buy me a welcome. I will come to the city even as a refugee, if the meaning of the refuge has changed, deleted from the old dictionary. But how could I create a dictionary of homes, when I have no imam whose prayers could remove my doubt? Though I have a God to whom I recite his verses privately until dawn reveals the city's face and tells us, you are safe from whatever you say or don't say believers and non-believers, all those who lit up the city's promises with candles in their fingers so it can see it's tomorrow our people. Homs, whose mother is Syria, is above all suspicion. I will go to Homs alone. I will come to her with love and affection. It's Homs that baptized me and Islamized me. It's only fitting I, long, I belong to her, a thousand loves, sorrows, and a river of memories for her to recover and for me to heal. May this prayer be answered by politics, by culture, by speaking to each other. I look forward to hearing from Lakta Brahimi and all the others at this uh, forum. Thank you very much. Good morning, <coughs> uh, <coughs> Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm deeply grateful to the Lotfiya Rabbani Foundation for inviting me to today's event. It is an honor indeed and a real pleasure for my wife and I to be here. It is partly nostalgia because we were privileged to know the late Mahmoud Rabbani and his wife Anissa, and we attended a similar event in the early 80s when the uh, Lutfi Rabbani was in its very early years. I'm very happy to see uh, Minister Kunduz and uh, to wish him well in his new position. 
I think he will be missed in Mali and in the United Nations, but I'm sure that he will continue to help over there and in, all, uh, in, in many other places. I'm very grateful to you for the kind words you have uh, said just now. And I am delighted to see that the Foundation continues to do and expand the work that its founder intended it to do, to honor <coughs> the memory of his mother and promote ideals close to his heart, namely creating better understanding and more cooperation between Europe, particularly the Netherlands and the Arab world. Mahmoud Rabbani believed passionately that a sustained and multiform dialogue between Europeans and Arabs would yield rich benefits on both sides of the Mediterranean. In a way, he himself and now his children and grandchildren are the best product of that cooperation. I don't know what Mahmoud al-Rabbani would say if he saw where we are now. I think he would be profoundly saddened by the state of affairs in the Arab world. 30 years ago, <coughs> Lebanon, with its 17 different communities, looked an oddity, and the Lebanese themselves and the rest of us were hoping that Lebanon would end its divisions along sectarian lines. Today, Lebanon, with its divisions, uh, is literally crushed under the weight of almost two million refugees from Syria. It was unable to hold parliamentary elections uh, a couple of years ago, and it was unable to elect a new President of the Republic this year. Uh, <clears throat> furthermore, as a leftover of its 15 years civil war of the 1970s and 80s, Lebanon has to accept <clears throat> a leading role for an armed militia, which is a state within the state. Yet, with all these problems, Lebanon <clears throat> Uh, with tensions and even occasional violence, confrontations, uh, the region looks at Lebanon as an admired and envied democratic corner of peace, stability, tolerance, and civility. Of course, uh, we're we are not trying to compare Lebanon to Holland or to Switzerland. We are comparing it to Syria and Iraq who used to be proud of their non-sectarian ways, if nothing else. Mahmoud Rabbani was spared the sight of the invasion of Iraq by the United States and its lasting catastrophic consequences for the people of Iraq on the United States itself, on the region, and on the entire world. He was also spared some of the saddest developments that have taken place in his beloved native Palestine or affected its people. And what would Mahmoud Rabbani think of cooperation between Europeans and Arabs? I have not been involved in any of the cooperation exercises that have been attempted between Europeans and the League of Arab States these past 20 years. But it does not seem that the Barcelona process or any other process, have produced any spectacular results. Mahmoud Rabbani would be profoundly saddened by the constant stream of news that would have us believe that what we do exchange these days are boatloads of people running away from fear, hunger, or both on our side of the Mediterranean, landing on your shores, and, and radicalized youth coming from your countries to, our, uh, to ours to learn how to kill in the most barbaric manner and for some to return back to your towns and villages to put into practice the horrific lessons they have learned in our lands. 
It is legitimate for us Arabs to say that those who these days claim to hold high the banners of Islam are not part of us. Mahmoud Rabbani would fully agree with our unanimous view that these people are not Muslims at all, in fact. They are a tiny minority, and they actually kill more of us than they kill of others. But it is not enough for, say, for us to say that. A tiny minority, they certainly are, but their voice is loud, much louder than ours. We, who call ourselves, and indeed are, the overwhelming majority. We must do better to understand and explain why this minority behaves the way it does, and we should find effective ways of limiting than ending their harmful ways. These ugly realities cannot be ignored. There is much we Arabs need to do that we are not doing or not doing well enough. I suppose there are also things that together as Europeans and as individual countries, you must do or do better. At the same time, there is much that Europeans and Arabs can do and must do together. To deal with extremism in all its manifestations needs more, not less, cooperation between our governments and between our societies. Mm -hmm. And that cooperation, it bears repeating, begins with a serious effort to understand fully and objectively what is happening in our respective regions and address those problems separately when possible and together when necessary. In the early days of 2011, most people on both sides of the Mediterranean were overwhelmed with joy and optimism when they saw that an irresistible wind of change was at long last blowing all over the Arab world. Someone called it the Arab Spring, and the name has stuck. I'm not sure we fully understood then or understand now why the desperate act of that unhappy university graduate, yet jobless young man who set himself on fire in Sidi Bouzid, Tunisia, started that incredible chain of events which, in less than three months, profoundly changed the political landscape in Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, Libya, and Syria. Yemen had been struggling with its demons for quite a few years before that, but it was conveniently agreed that it, too, was part of the Arab Spring. Let's not forget, by the way, that for a month or so, governments, pundits, spies also, and the common man, in your countries as well as in ours, underestimated the movement or dismissed it altogether. President Ben Ali of Tunisia would certainly ride the storm, everybody said, during the Christmas and New Year season of 2010 and 11. His police force was too strong and too efficient, and Tunisians are gentle, peaceful people. Wrong. Ben Ali escaped to Saudi Arabia on 14th of January, 27 days after Mohammed Bouazizi set himself on fire in Sidi Bouzid. When the wind of change reached Cairo, it was also said that Mubarak will not fall, especially after he reassured everyone that he would not seek a new mandate as president, and more importantly, he would not seek to impose his son Jamal as a successor. Wrong again. Mubarak gave up even faster than Ben Ali had done. Egyptians say their revolution started on the 25th of, Janu of January. Their president resigned on the 11th of February, and a mere 17 days later. Wrong on Tunisia, wrong on Egypt. What would everyone say about Syria when uh, things started to, to happen? over there in March. Uh, <clears throat> how long would it take, how long would Bashar al-Assad last if Ben Ali lasted 27 days and Mubarak just 70? Certainly not much was the, uh, com was the common, uh, common wisdom. Bashar al-Assad and his father 
have Hafez before him had ruled supreme over Syria for a total of 40 years, surely they are not going to last long. Numerous questions are awaiting answers. For example, was it right to call these developments an Arab Spring at all? And if yes, is the spring still there? Or has it turned into a freezing winter? Or, considering the geographical situation of the Arab world, into a torrid summer? How come the region, as well as the rest of the world, did not pay attention to ISIS, or ISIL, or Daesh, until they took control of Mosul this past summer? And when it was noticed, everything else seemed to have been forgotten. We talk now only of Daesh. There is nothing else in, 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 in the Middle East. I don't think it was wrong to call the chain of events set in motion after the tragic event in Sidi Bouzaid on the 17th of December 2010, and an Arab Spring, on condition we understand that it came as a natural, though belated, popular, spontaneous reaction to the political stagnation and, in some places, humiliating regression, which have been the distinctive feature of our region for far too long. Change was needed, and people were craving for it. But change cannot happen overnight, and if this is a spring, it will last a very, very many years. But conditions were not the same in all countries. Every country had its own circumstances, its own history, its own political, social, cultural, and political conditions, its capabilities, its, its specific uh, uh, aspirations. In Morocco, King Mohammed VI reacted fast and well ahead of everyone. He dissolved parliament, put together a constitutional commission to, pro to produce a new constitution, dissolved parliament, had a new parliament elected, and asked the leader of the Islamist party, who did better than all other parties in the election, to form a new government. It seems that the cohabitation between the monarchy and the Moroccan brand of political Islam is working to the satisfaction of both sides. In Tunisia and Egypt, demonstrations were admirably nonviolent. In both countries, the police tried to provoke the demonstrators into using guns. They did not fall into that trap. In Syria, the demonstrations were shy at the beginning. The government, on the other hand, showed absolutely no patience and attacked the young with full brutal, for, uh, br brutal force. The slogans of the Syrian demonstrators were, at first, different from those in Tunisia and Egypt. The battle cry, the people want to change the regime, came to Syria much later. In the beginning, demonstrations in Syria wanted only freedom and dignity. But like their Tunisians and Egyptian brethren, Syrians were determined to remain peaceful. It was months later that guns appeared in the ranks of the demonstrators. But even then, the demonstrators themselves claimed that the gun were brought in by agents provocateurs, infiltrated in their midst by the regime. But the government on, the, uh, on their side were, and still are, saying that the conspiracy had guns ready in the country long before March 2011. Indeed, the government claimed that even those kids who started it all in Dara were part of the conspiracy. In Libya, France led Western countries to a systematic bombing campaign that ended the regime but did not put a new one in its place. It was regime destruction, not regime change. They did from the air, they, the, the, Europe, the Westerners did from the air what Mr. Paul Bremer was tasked to do on the ground in Iraq when he dissolved the Iraqi army and allowed Ahmed Shalabi to turn the so-called debatification into a dissolution of state institutions. It was clear from the very beginning 
that these events were going to be the historic test for political Islam. Islamic parties have done well in Morocco and even better in Tunisia. The Muslim Brotherhood movement in Egypt seem to have missed the boat. They would probably say they were not given a chance. One year in power was hardly long enough to pass judgment on a government, any government. In Turkey, President Erdogan has shown that he is deeply committed to the Muslim Brotherhood movement. His support to the movement in Egypt has been and continues to be unwavering. For the moment, at least, the important experiment uh, is taking place in Tunisia about uh, uh, political Islam. Constitution making was successful, and the Nahda party, although dominant in parliament and in the street, was patient and ready to compromise. They even agreed to pull out and give power to a government of technocrats to prepare and organize parliamentary and presidential elections. They renewed and honored their commitment to not have a candidate for the presidency. They even abstained from officially supporting one of the 27 presidential candidates. And when they came a distant second in the parliamentary election, they immediately accepted the results. This is clearly a political party whose strategy is for the long haul not for immediate gains. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt were not so patient, yet the future of political Islam will be determined in Egypt. There, the dissolved party of the Brotherhood, supported by Qatar and Turkey, maintains that the huge popular movement which brought out a total of 30 million people in the streets on the 30th of June uh, 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 practically every, and, and, and these demonstrations took place in every city and every village against their rule was a counter-revolution, a coup d'etat, and the restoration of the Mubarak regime. The Brotherhood has certainly lost a great deal of support. They will probably not disappear from the political scene in Egypt. One hopes that their radical wing will not take them the way the, their branch in Algeria was taken in the 1990s when, having been deprived of an electoral victory, they plunged the country into a devastating civil war that went on for a full decade and caused the death of as many as 200,000 people and destroyed much of the country's infrastructure and quite important industrial and cultural base. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that as a Palestinian, Mahmoud Rabbani would have asked the same question I asked my Palestinian friends on several occasions. Why did you not do what the Tunisians did in Avenue Bourguiba, Tunis, and the Egyptians did in Tahrir Square? Go out and stay out and demand the end of occupation and say that you will not go home until a satisfactory answer was given you. Of course, one cannot, one, will, one cannot expect Mr. Netanyahu to get in as fast as Ben Ali or Mubarak did. And indeed, he would not have given it at all. The various answers that I got from my Palestinian, my Palestinian friends did not convince me. I still think that it was worth trying, and maybe it's not too late. I also think that Mahmoud Rabbani would have been profoundly saddened by the long division between Fatah and Hamas. He would not have understood why they have failed to implement the countless reconciliation agreements they have signed over the years. Don't they, don't, don't they see how deeply harmful to their cause these divisions are? I think Mahmoud Rabbani would have been equally saddened by the attitude of most of the Arab governments who seem to have turned their back on Palestine. The Israelis and their supporters are wrong, however, to think that the Arab peoples are themselves giving up on the Palestinian cause. I don't think they are. More importantly, 
the Palestinians themselves in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Jerusalem, in Israel, in the diaspora, are not giving up and will not give up. I think that Mahmoud Rabbani would have been greatly encouraged by developments in Europe on the Palestinian question. It is not an ins insignificant fact that one of the first political decisions of a new prime minister in Sweden was to recognize the Palestinian state and the king of Sweden to send a message of congratulation to President Mahmoud Abbas on the occasion of the Palestinian National Day. Nor is it insignificant that in the British and Spanish parliaments, a symbolic vote on the Palestinian state is overwhelmingly supportive of Palestinian rights. Equally encouraging is the BDS, uh, Boycott, Disinvestment and Sanctions Movement, which is gaining more and more support all over, all, at all levels in Europe, in Africa, Asia, and the Americas, even among a growing number of US citizens. The efforts of Secretary of State John Kerry were admirable and we all should be grateful to him for his honest and dedicated commitment to a just peace. But I am sure he knows that the present Israeli government will not allow his efforts to bear fruit. As Archbishop Desmond Tutu said in an open letter that the Israeli, to the Israeli people published in, the, in Haaretz last August, and I quote, the state of Israel is behaving as if there is no tomorrow. Its people will not live the peaceful and secure lives they crave and are entitled to, as long as their leaders perpetuate conditions that sustain the conflict." End of quote. Also, it's high time uh, that the Palestinians and everyone else accept that the United States cannot usefully continue its exclusive mediation between Israel and Palestinians. The U.S. is too closely associated with the State of Israel to be an honest broker. And the Quartet has also outlived its usefulness and should be allowed to fade out. The European Union, or a number of like-minded European governments, should play a political role that is up to the level of their very generous humanitarian and economic support to the people of Palestine and their well-proven commitment to the security and welfare of uh, the people of Israel, I think, gives them the, the possibility and the right to do that. Let me quote Archbishop Desmond Tutu again. No human-made problems are intractable. When humans put their heads together with the earnest desire to overcome them. No peace is impossible when people are determined to achieve it. May the Lutfi Arabani long continue to prosper to achieve the vision of Mahmoud Rabbani on both sides of the Mediterranean. Thank you very much indeed. Merci. This sofa is so nice, you know, we could just turn like this and forget that all of you are here, <laughs> but we won't. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who know Lakhtar Brahimi, you know that he's not just a man of great wisdom and experience, he's a man with a, a very big heart. And so it's not this surprise, surprising that this morning his comments to us were constantly punctuated with his recognition of profound sadness. A profound sadness, he reminded all of us that Mahmoud Rabani would share profound sadness at what has happened in Iraq, in Palestine, the rise of Daesh. But a man who has spent a lifetime dedicated 
to trying to resolve crises and conflicts everywhere also never fails to leave us with some threads of wisdom and some constructive suggestions for how to move forward. And I think in our conversation that we're so privileged to have with Lakhtar Brahimi, we should perhaps focus on how to try to find a way forward. And this is what we're going to try to do today, to talk about dialogue and understanding, is how to have this cooperation from the ground up. But I'm going to begin, perhaps, with what comes from the top down, since we were also privileged to hear from the foreign minister who talked about finding a greater role for Europe. And Lakhtar, you mentioned how the Barcelona process has failed to live up to its promise, but that if it is to do so, there must, be, must begin with an effort for both sides to better understand each other. F with your experience working in all these crises, you mentioned, of course, Israel-Palestine won the need for a greater role for Europe. But do you think there is space, real political space, for Europe to move into these places? It's not either dominated by the United States or dominated by the stubborn persistence of problems that even Europe cannot resolve? Uh, yeah, probably Europe cannot resolve mm -hmm. the problems uh, overnight or even over the long time. But uh, uh, I'm absolutely certain uh, that the space exists. Whether the Europeans have the will to occupy that space is a different question. Uh, I also am absolutely convinced, as a matter of fact I know, that many people in Washington uh, in the administration and outside of the administration would be extremely happy if Europe played a more important political role because they know that they cannot. There is a limit to what they can do. They cannot move, uh, you know, they can scratch their head in the Middle East without the permission of Israel. Uh, so they cannot be uh, uh, an honest broker with all the admiration, respect, and uh, we have for, for you know, the people and the government of the United States, this is a fact. Uh, you remember Aaron Miller, mm. who was the number two of, uh, uh, what's his name, Dennis Ross. Mm. I, I heard him myself once on television, but he's, he, was, he never repeated it again. He said, our mediation, frankly, consisted of going to the Israelis, asking them what they want, and then we go and try to get it for them. This is how, how they see their, their, their role. That cannot continue. And the quartet, uh, you know, no matter what we think, whether it should have been created or not, it has been created, it has been there for a long time, it is useless now. And we should not pretend that we have a process when we have not. If we cannot have something else, so be it. But we cannot pretend that something is happening when nothing is happening. So this is... Uh, and the space is there. That is why I say uh, the European Union or like-minded countries. Uh, if, if all the countries uh, in Europe, as you know, they need to be unanimous to, to, to scratch their head also. Yeah? Uh, uh, if, if they cannot do that, perhaps a number of countries can, 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 can come together and you know, respond to what their people are telling them. I think more and more the, Europe, the, the European people are saying, you know, you, 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 know, you all are very uh, you know, proud to speak of your values and uh, you, know, you lecture us all the time. Fine, that's most welcome. You know, go on lecturing us. But uh, what is happening in, in Palestine runs counter to everything you believe in. So it's high time that you, you, know, you live up in Palestine to your principles as you live up to them elsewhere. But it's, it's, a double, it's double edged for Europe, isn't it? Because the, for the Israelis, they've often criticized individual European nations and Europe as a whole for taking too strong a position. For example, there's been a paper that's been leaked to Israeli newspapers saying that the European Union, the Commission, is now considering possibly withdrawing its ambassadors in protest over the expansion of, of Jewish settlements, which many would regard as a key obstacle to the establishment of a Palestinian state. But if Europe was going to remain 
faithful to its ideals, it makes it difficult for it to be the mediator because Israel is likely not to accept it? Uh, yeah, but you see, uh, you know, of course, you know, mediation will not work if the two parties are not... Uh, uh, but, but the non-mediation we have now uh, is a waste of time. So let's stop that uh, and then see what, 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 what is it that we can do. Uh, I think that you know, the Israeli uh, uh, right-wing uh, have convinced the majority in their country that look, we are all right. Nobody is asking anything from us. So why should we make any concessions? I think if, if uh, you know, people raise a little bit their voice, and if you Europeans just live up to, you know, to your, your own principles uh, and uh, values, uh, of course, the Israeli government will immediately say, you know, Europe is disqualifying itself, they cannot play a role. But I think a lot of Israeli people will start, you know, uh, wondering whether their government is leading them in the right direction. Let me ask you one more question before I then open it up to the floor and look at other areas of, of the Middle East and, and put it to you that in many countries, and particularly after this so-called Arab Spring, many Arab states, Arab people and governments are saying, we're fine on our own. We'll, we don't need your help anymore. You know, Arab solutions for Arab problems. So we saw that in Egypt when the Europeans, Kathy Ashton, tried to resolve the crisis with the Muslim Brotherhood. She was politely and sometimes not so politely told, it's none of your business. In Libya now, we see the Egyptians, the Emiratis, becoming involved militarily as well as politically. And Bernardino, the EU envoy, uh, Jonathan Powell, the British envoy, they're uh, having a hard time with their role because Arab states, with their own proxies inside, are becoming more involved. Is this also a time when Arab states want to resolve things on their own, for better or worse? Um, uh, you know, yeah, you have spoken about too many things mm. at the same time. Yeah. Um, Libya, you know, we cannot forget that the, 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 the French and the British and a few others have destroyed Libya. Uh, while they said at the United Nations that they were not going for for uh, regime change, nobody is uh, you know, shedding many tears about uh, Muammar Gaddafi and his regime. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's good that uh, that they are gone, but the way it was done uh, has created lots of problems. They have destroyed the country, and they haven't. Ha they. Uh, I'm not sure whether they knew what they were doing, you know, because you know, they have destroyed the country, and the people they were counting on uh, have not been able to to, to build anything uh, uh, you know, credible and lasting. Uh, so we cannot we cannot. Uh, I think that uh, you know the Europeans, the French and the British and the others, uh, made a very big mistake when. Uh, President Zuma and four other presidents were going to Libya to talk to Muammar Gaddafi and the opposition in Benghazi and asked the French to, to postpone a meeting they had on Libya 24 hours uh, to allow them to go and talk and then join them in Paris uh, and tell them what they have seen and heard. I think that if they had supported the African uh, attempt to work out solution, maybe it would have been much better for Libya, much better for the region, and much better for Europe. I have been saying for a long time that Algeria and Egypt had a responsibility to help the Libyans out of their trouble. They are neighbors, they know the country extremely well, they know the people very well. It happens that we in Algeria have a debt the Libyans helped us great deal during our fight for independence. Uh, I, I, the, the, the Algerians and the, and, the, and the Egyptians are now talking to one another. I hope that they will continue to talk to one another and, and help uh, Libya. I think they can do that much better than the Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, for the moment, the kind of help that is going there, uh, you know, there's question mark. Uh, Turkey and Qatar are, are, are supporting the Islamists. 
uh, Egypt and the UAE are supporting the non-Islamists, that's not the way to do it. I think, uh, you know, I think if Algeria and, and Egypt could get together and put some kind of, uh, of process uh, together with the Libyans, with the Europeans, uh, and, and of course the Africans, uh, it will be much better for the Libyans and for everybody else. So a time when Europe has to be more cognizant of what the efforts on the ground themselves and among the neighbors to resolve this on their own. Yeah, you know, they have got to recognize that they, first of all, they made a mess. They contributed to the mess that exists and that they cannot solve their mess alone. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, maybe they'll make things worse. Now, do we have any experts on how to solve no. messes in mm. the audience? Would anyone like to ask a question of Lakta Brahimi? We have microphones. So this gentleman here and then the woman behind. Hi, my name is Fuad Hamdan. I'm a political consultant and I'm head up the head of a foundation called the Rule of Law Foundation in Amsterdam. My question is about uh, Iran and its role in Syria, Iraq. How would you assess the role of Iran in Syria and Iraq now and how would you link that with the current or with the postponed nuclear negotiations. Do you think that a political solution is possible with Iran in Syria? And do you think they will ever give up the dream of having a nuclear bomb? <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, but there again, let's, let, us, let us first remind ourselves of, of uh, very well-known facts. The Americans invaded Iraq, and uh, you know, uh, I think the Iranians were very grateful to them that they eliminated their worst enemy, who was Saddam Hussein. But the Americans told the Iranians, no, we, we are going to do better for you. We are going to give you Iran, uh, Iraq. So you know, I don't know whether the Iranians said thank you very much or not, but you know, they had taken Iraq. Uh, they have more influence in Iraq than the Americans do, much, much more. And they have more influence in Syria than the Russians have. These are facts. Um, I think whether they will, uh, they will you know, be, whether they will be very constructive or half constructive or not constructive, I mean, let's, let's ask them. <laughs> let's, uh, let, let's talk to them. Uh, and, you, you, you know, I think what, uh, what I, I thought I knew is that when you are part of a problem, it's good that you are part of the solution. Now what we hear is that, you know, if you are part of the problem, you cannot be part of the solution. I don't think this is, this is right. Iran has to, be, has to be talked to and has to be asked questions about the responsibility of in what is happening in Syria and what is happening in, in, in Iraq. Whether they will you know, immediately say, yeah, great, uh, let's work together or not, uh, you, you, know, you have got to talk to them. Hello, my name is Sandra Sahili. I'm a lawyer at the uh, Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Mr. Brahimi, I remember seeing you on television when I was a little girl, uh, and uh, the grown-ups in Lebanon. Still around, yeah. <laughs> and the grown-ups around me saying, this is the man who might end the war in Lebanon. So it's an honor for me to be here today and to be able to ask you a question. I would like to uh, hear your views uh, as a peace broker, a, a negotiator, or a facilitator when international organizations like the United Nations or intergovernmental organizations like the EU and NATO sponsor uh, or facilitate peace agreements uh, or national reconciliation agreements, what do you think should be the role subsequently to ensure that all the tenets of such an agreement are actually implemented? And how do you uh, ensure that such follow-up efforts um, are not in violation of national sovereignty. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> you know, I belong to a generation uh, and, you know, background, my personal background is that I'm a great believer in 
national sovereignty. Uh, and big countries really, of course, believe very strongly in their national sovereignty, but perhaps not so much in the sovereignty of others. <laughs> uh, but I think that, you know, the United Nations, uh, NATO is different. NATO is a, is a military alliance. So I will not talk about NATO. But uh, I think that uh, if, you, if you mediate uh, conflict and you get an agreement uh, between the parties, I think the implementation has to continue with the parties. But I, I have written an article together with a, a young man. He's not a young man anymore. He's in the White House now called uh, Salman Ahmed, uh, called the seven deadly sins of mediation, where uh, the, main, the main message was that, uh, you know, political work does not stop with the signing of the agreement. Uh, when you have signed an agreement, then you've got to make sure that you continue to support the implementation. It is as important or even more important than, than the actual uh, agreement. Uh, what to do? Uh, yeah, you know, mm, the UN doesn't like to use force, and they are right. Uh, but certainly when there are spoilers uh, that can be clearly identified, uh, I think the, even the UN can, can, use, can use force against them. But I think uh, you know, a, a, a mediation is a political process. It's, it's complicated. It needs patience. Uh, it needs commitment. And it, le and it needs support. Uh, Liz knows very well Afghanistan, uh, even better than I do. Uh, in 1999, I, I resigned. I, I was been trying to help in Afghanistan and resigned and told the Security Council, I'm resigning because you are not supporting me. Uh, if I'm sent by the Security Council and the Sec Security Council is not interested, I cannot do uh, much. Uh, so, you know, that political commitment from the countries, the countries that have clout and influence is indispensable. You know, if Iran and Pakistan are not supporting you when you are trying to do something in Afghanistan, you know, you are going to be in trouble uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, the same thing in, in, uh, in, in Syria and, and Iraq. Uh, when they, the countries of the region are so divided, and indeed, even the Europeans and the Americans are divided, you cannot go, go very far. If you speak in one voice, it, uh, uh, if all these people speak in one voice, it's different. Hmm. By the way, no one knows more about Afghanistan than Lakhja Brahimi. I think you, you have Afghan nationality now. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Nikolaus van Dam, former ambassador in various Middle Eastern countries and elsewhere. Mr. Lakhja Brahimi, do you think the countries which are now involved in attacks on ISIS, Daesh, that they should coordinate both military and politically with Damascus, with the, the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, that's that's a, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to them, not to me. You know, <laughs> um, you know it, it all depends what 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 uh, co what coordination means. Uh, the regime in Damascus, they think now that they have been vindicated 100%. We have been saying that there is nothing except a conspiracy and terrorism. Now, at long last, you all say the same thing. So you, you, you are joining us. And uh, if you want to talk to us, it will be on our terms. This is definitely not, uh, not the manner in which it should be done. I think the government has got to understand that they are, uh, you know, they bear a huge responsibility in what is happening in their country. 
Daesh did not exist uh, uh, before. It has been the result of this crisis that has uh, you know, come about because the government did not, uh, you know, they didn't do what the Moroccan uh, king has done. They, they didn't respond to uh, the, the demands, the aspirations of their people. And one thing led to the another and we have this situation. So yes, talk to, to them, definitely. Uh, you know, the, 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 the attitude which was saying that you are not going to talk politics until the regime falls. That has never been the position of the United Nations. Neither the Secretary General, nor Kofi Annan, nor, nor, nor myself. Uh, we, the, the, we are we were, and I think the UN still is in favor of a negotiated settlement between the government of Bashar al-Assad and and his people. Uh, uh, so talk to them, yes. Coordinate with them, yes. But uh, not on, uh, on the uh, conditions uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the regime and Bashar al-Assad. There's two questions in the back. Oh, uh, yes, two. Maybe we'll take the two of them. Hello, um, my name is Sharaf Darzid. I'm a dancer and choreographer from Palestine, and I do live there. Um, in such a conference, as I always ask, uh, what can we do as Europeans, not just as a Palestinians? Uh, my question what is: What can we do as Europeans? Yes, not and? just as Palest not just as Palestinians. My uh. question is: What about boycotting? What about boycotting? Do you think BDS? Mm -hmm. Do you think BDS movement could be a solution? as what happened in South Africa against the apartheid? Sure. Thank you. Uh, definitely. Uh, you know, Desmond Tutu is, is a friend of, you know, we are together in the elders. Uh, and, uh, you know, he has been reminding us of the fact that uh, in South Africa, a lot of people were claiming, you know, Mr. Thatcher in particular, were claiming that they will not boycott South Africa because it will harm the, uh, the South African people, the blacks, the poor, more than anybody else. And Desmond Tutu tells me, we told them, no, we are, we are, we are willing to accept the consequences, we are willing to suffer, uh, but uh, sanctions and boycott is, will, will be useful and, and it has been effective. Uh, so I think that it is, it is important. This movement is, is probably the best there is for the moment. And uh, I hope it will, it will you know, swell up and, 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 and get the support of more and more people. Lady here. I'm going to have to close the list soon. Uh, we have a long coffee break. I might just take, if, if, with Lakhtar's permission, take a little bit of time off the coffee break. Um, yes, this lady here. Okay, hello, and um, thank you very much, Mr. Rahimi. Uh, my name is Mariam. I'm, I'm a master's student at the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, and the, my question is more general. Since um, the discourse of the war on terror led by the US, um, we've seen a securitization of development generally, where um, development and um, international cooperation is shaped by the countries or the northern world's um, own security towards the incoming threat from the south. And, and my question is, how do you think this impacts on, um, on peace processes in general? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, uh, you know, I think the the, 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 even the expression war on terror is a misnomer. Uh, you, know, you don't fight terror. Maybe you find terrorists you know, rather than terror. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, if you want really to look at this uh, seriously, the, what, is, what is the definition of terror, terror terrorism and terrorists? Uh, Mandela was called a terrorist. I was called a terrorist. A lot of people, I think, sitting here have been called terrorists. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's make sure 
uh, what we are talking about and what kind of war we are we are participating uh, we are participating in. Second thing is uh, I believe very very passionately and strongly that uh, especially if you are talking about making peace about mediating you've got to talk to everybody. I think one of the big mistakes we made in, in Afghanistan is the boycott of the Taliban. We should have talked to the Taliban more uh, than, than, than we have done. It is not normal that I am the only one from the United Nations and from the so-called international community who ever met Muhammad Omar. Uh, that's, that's not normal. It's not normal that you don't meet uh, um, uh, what's his name, um, uh, Nasrallah in, in Lebanon, or uh, Qasem Soleimani in Iran. These are, I mean, you can call them terrorists as long as you like. Uh, Nasrallah, you know, is a man in a position where nothing can happen in Lebanon if he doesn't agree to. So if you are really interested in Lebanon and you want to help the Lebanese, you cannot not talk to, uh, to, to Nasrallah. Uh, Qasem Soleimani is the most important man in Iraq and Syria these days. Uh, how come there again? I am probably the only one that uh, talked to both of them. Now I can say this. I wasn't even allowed to say it when I was in the United Nations. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, war on terror, war on terrorists, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, 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 can be fully justified. Uh, but, uh, you know, politics require dialogue. And dialogue must not exclude anyone. Even Al-Qaeda-linked groups and uh, Daesh? Uh, you know, ultimately, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't think you need to talk to them now, and I'm not, I don't think they will want to talk mm -hmm. to you, so the problem doesn't arise. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if they are around uh, for a long time, they will probably, you know, if they want to really, if they're really thinking of playing a role, and uh, a political role in their country, they will have to evolve. When they do, I think, uh, yes, you, you need to talk to everybody. And then, you know, you must have people like me who talk to everybody, so you don't need to, to do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it together. Um, thank you. Thank you. Tahrid al Khudari, uh, editor at fanag.com. You mentioned the influential uh, role that uh, Iran uh, plays in both uh, um, Iraq and Syria. What, how do you describe the Saudi role at this uh, stage? Also, I see you as the best mediator in the region. Which body, given the fact that you mentioned the weakness of the United Nations, the absence uh, of uh, you know, the role uh, of the EU and, of course, uh, the US, which body you are willing to work with to, you know, to continue such role you've been mm. active at? I've retired. You haven't heard, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, Tagrid was a journalist in Gaza uh, for many uh, years. Uh, Tagrid was a journalist uh, in Gaza. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah you, I think the United Nations is really the, uh, uh, you know, the organization that has the credibility and can generate the support uh, to to run a, a political uh, a political uh, 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 political mediation. And they are doing so. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, when I resigned, uh, that you know, the UN cannot turn its back on, on Syria, it cannot turn its back on, on, on Iraq. Uh, but you know, the UN has no money, no weapons, no clout. It has to borrow all that from its members. If its members are not willing to, 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 to support it, then, then it will not be able to do uh, much. But definitely the UN is, is the, the body that should, should lead uh, any, any kind of serious uh, negotiation and mediation. I have two. 
the Saudis. Huh? Uh, you know, the Saudis, I think they are strongly supporting uh, the uh, opposition. In, uh, they, they, they are giving money and, and weapons. I don't think it is a secret there. They belong to this uh, so-called London 11 about Syria and the new coalition against, uh, against uh, Daesh. Uh, they are a very, very important country in the region. Uh, and I think uh, a, a, a stronger, not a weaker, role from them uh, is, is desirable. There's two more questions on the list, and sadly we're going to have to close. This gentleman here and this gentleman with the orange shirt. Yes, thank you for being here, Mr. Ibrahimi. Uh, my name is Islam Qasim, Wafsar University. My question is, uh, what do you think is the most likely end solution in Syria? <laughs> you mean political or military? <laughs> uh, 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 if I knew, I wouldn't have resigned. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer that uh, every problem has a solution. Uh, the thing is, when that solution happens and what price the people will be made to pay before uh, the Syrians have already paid a huge price. I'm afraid they will pay some more. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't believe that uh, there are many people in Syria who want to break it into uh, 17 or 18 uh, statelets. Uh, I don't think there are many Syrians uh, thinking that. I don't think that the Alawis, you know, the Alawis have left the mountain, the Jabal al-Alawi. Uh, they are in Damascus, they are in Aleppo, they, are, they don't want to go back there and, and, and form a small state up there. Uh, with Christians, where, where would the Christian state be in Syria? Uh, uh, and I don't think that the Syrians have dreamed of a state of their own in, in, in Syria. Uh, so I, th I, I, I believe that what uh, uh, Mr. Sykes and Monsieur Pico have done, you know, maybe we dislike it, it is there and I think it, it, will, it, uh, it will not be easily destroyed. Iraq also, I'm, I'm not I'm not convinced that the Sunni, the Arab Sunnis, the Arab Shia want to break up and have, have a different state. They, 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 I think they want to live together under different conditions. I, I suspect that even the Kurds, they are so happy the way they are. You know, they have a, a, a kind of state. Uh, so they are, they are independent in Erbil and they are Iraqis in Baghdad. That's great. You know, why, 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 why would they change that? Uh, so I, I think that the, you know these countries are not are not going to break up anytime soon. But of course, if if these terrible things continue to happen for another ten years, uh, then you know one doesn't know what will happen. Last question. Uh, thank you. Good morning. My name is Diel van der Linde. I work in arts and culture in the region, in the Middle East and North Africa. Thank you, Mr. Brahimi, for sharing your insights, your wonderful insights. In fact, you were, went already partly in, into the question I had in your last remarks. Uh, my, my question is, how far would you go in to defend the idea of uh, national sovereignty? Uh, how sacred is it for you, given in fact that indeed part of the, you can even when you look at the, the way the borders are drawn, part of these borders are uh, uh, the produ product of a uh, uh, colonial uh, past? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, you know, it all depends when, you know, this responsibility to protect. Uh, when you speak about it, 
in what context and what is it, what are your motives and what is it that you want to do? Uh, you know, if uh, the responsibility to protect was officially invoked in Libya, it's not great the way it has been done. I think Bush and uh, a lot of people around him will, will tell you that is what we did in Iraq in 19, 2003. That's also not great. Uh, uh, but when uh, you know, people like Bashar al-Assad and uh, people like him before and in the future uh, say, allow us to kill our people because it's a question of sovereignty, then uh, questioning sovereignty is, is understandable and may even be uh, positive. Uh, you know, I, I was very, very much against uh, humanitarian intervention, very much. Uh, even the responsibility to protect, I would have preferred, I mean, it's a beautiful expression, uh, I think the, the right to be protected is better than responsibility to protect. Mm. Uh, I, as, as a weak individual, community, group, or nation, need help. So I have a, I have, uh, you know, I have a right to be, uh, to be defended and protected. When you say uh, responsibility to protect, whose responsibility? And who is going to give that responsibility? It is the Security Council. Not always. If it's the Security Council, I have no problem. Uh, but when people say we are exercising the uh, responsibility to protect, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit nervous. Great <laughs> British uh, understatement. Uh, Thank you very much. Dr. Ibrahimi, I, th I think I speak for everyone here. It's always a great privilege to hear your thoughts, your, your wisdom. It's very nice that you'll be here with us today and that Melissa is also here with us. You left us to share what you called your profound sadness at many of the developments, but I think you should also inspire us with your comment that every problem has a solution, even if there are all too many problems. And perhaps you, that I sh shall, like you, quote Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who describes our present condition as one that we are all prisoners of our hope. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, this session has ended, and perhaps instead of quoting Mahmoud Rabani, I shall remember his mother Lutfia, who in addition to adding her wisdom to our day, would say, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for coffee or tea, <laughs> but please be on time. We're going to start again. We have a special treat at 11.30, and don't be late. Thank you very much. <laughs>